Open a Digital Domain Rules. Uh, welcome to question 77 of the Secunda Secunde. The topic for this lecture is cheating, and I am Dr. Thibault. Uh, when we're dealing with cheating, we're looking under the virtue of justice, and we're looking at commutative justice in contrast to distributive justice, and commutative justice is between individuals within a society and we've dealt with uh, unjust deeds, uh, things like murder, theft, robbery, uh, maiming, uh, imprisonment, uh, hitting people, and we've dealt with uh, vices of commutative justice in terms of words, and we looked at judicial words, which were uh, against um, uh, justice, and then we have then looked also uh, uh, at backbiting and uh, reviling and uh, derision, uh, tail bearing. Um, we looked at a number of things, which were um, which were type of um, uh, words which were against the community, against the individual, against people within our against our neighbor within society. Um, now we're dealing with ones which St. Thomas has identified as voluntary, voluntary commutations. Now the other ones in words were considered involuntary, which is hard to sometimes get your mind around because you think involuntary. How is a court system involuntary? It sounds awfully voluntary. How is backbiting or uh, reviling or derision, uh, tail bearing? Uh, how are these involuntary? They seem to be voluntary actions. Well, they are voluntary actions. They're different because in this regard, people are, the victim in this case, is participating. So because the victim is participating, it's considered voluntary. If somebody, if you're walking down the street, and somebody comes out and starts screaming at you, dishonoring you, it's not voluntary. It's being done to you. Um, if you're just going, you know, minding your own business and somebody's telling tales behind your back, uh, trying to get your friends to abandon you, this is involuntary. You had no part of, of it. Um, same thing, I guess, with the judicial system, right? If there's an unjust accuser or there's an unjust judge, you're not, you're not participating in the judge's dishonesty. This is being done to you. In this one, we're dealing with only two topics, cheating in terms of economics uh, and usury. So in these regards, people are participating in the activity. Therefore, it is considered voluntary. Uh, in this section, there's four articles. And the first one is considering uh, if you're selling an item for more than it's worth, worth uh, is the question. Now, if you were a modern day American capitalist, that is uh, at the heart of what you're trying to do. If you were to go on the show Shark Tank and you were to say, oh, I'm not going to try to sell my product for more than it's worth, it would probably not fund uh, your commercial enterprise. The idea is you want to have as little input of energy and money as possible and maximum outcome as possible. Uh, in terms of getting rich in, in economics. Uh, St. Thomas is not on Shark Tank. He would not agree with this system. Uh, so this is kind of, kind of countercultural if you think about it, that um, presenting a different way of doing economics than our current system. There is some overlap, but there's certainly some uh, differences as well. And uh, if for any of us that are trying to be moral and good, um, the economic stuff is sometimes the hardest stuff because it's easy in some regards to know not to have an affair uh, or not to murder someone, but it's, sometimes it's a little harder when it's don't make as big of a profit as you can. <laughs> well, that's, that's tough. And as St. Thomas even points out, it's a kind of gray area. It's not easily to, it's not easy to mathematically calculate what is the right price. Um, he says, no man should sell a thing for more than it's worth. That's just as straightforward. He says, justice involves, remember we're under the section of justice, justice involves equality. So a thing for more than it's worth or for less than it's worth is unequal and thus 
unjust. So if you're selling something under price, uh, or somebody's getting a deal for too cheap, that's not equal. Therefore, that's not right. Uh, and if you're selling it for too much, then that's not equal. So that's not right. So you were, you were really aiming at a sweet spot here. I guess this makes it really a good idea, a good part of, of uh, moral the moral theology because you're really aiming at that that uh, golden mean here. Um, he does bring up an exception. So if a person has a great need for a certain thing and the person who has the thing uh, would suffer without it, you know, they don't really want to sell it because they need it right now. Um, you know, they could sell it then for above the typical market price because the seller shouldn't have to take a loss, uh, a personal loss in order to sell it. Because again, we're aiming at equality. So um, if one certain person really needs it, another person needs it, you know, you kind of have to hit that sweet spot of where you are compensating the seller for, um, for their loss. Uh, in contrast, if somebody has a great need for it and the other person has no particular loss by selling it, then they should just sell the market price. So if, let's say, a farmer needs to harvest the crop and his tractor breaks down right at harvest season, you know, things are at a premium at harvest season, and a tractor sale seller has a good stock of tractors, but they know that the, the farmer is desperate, he can't raise the price uh, on that farmer because they know the farmer needs it. Um, if, if it's not a loss, you know, if you're a tractor salesperson and you have plenty in stock. Um, now, if, you, if you're talking about two farmers and both farmers need it, need the tractor for uh, harvesting their crop, uh, and one needs it more, uh, then I guess they could say, yes, you should sell it to that person, but then they should pay you at a higher price, maybe the, the loss of your, your crops. Maybe you have smaller fields or a cheaper crop, you know, you let the cheaper crop go in order to save the bigger crop, but then the, the person who has a smaller crop should compensate, be compensated for their loss. That would be perfectly fair. Um, now, St. Thomas points out, you know, you could say, this is very uh, Pollyanna, you know, this is maybe in the Middle Ages, they did things this way, but it's not so common today. Um, well, St. Thomas even brings this up and he says, yeah, this is very common. Of course, people do this. This is the nature of it. People get, try to get as much as they can for an item. Um, he says, but divine law leaves nothing unpunished that is contrary to virtue. Um, as I pointed out, he said, the prices aren't exact. So, you know, you know there's no like exact right number 100% of the time, but there is clearly below far below or far, far above that right price. Um, I guess this is not looking at uh, uh, Adam Smith's invisible hand. Uh, he thinks that we, it could be agreed upon better, maybe. Um, in reality, uh, uh, it's wicked for people to take advantage of other people. Um, um, and people have the free will and they have the ability to overcome their uh, desires to make a lot of money, uh, overcome their inclinations uh, to take more than they need. Uh, of course, there are people who have those inclinations, they have the desires, they have the legal ability to, it's lawful to take advantage of somebody. But uh, he said it's, uh, no, nothing goes unpunished, so don't do not do it. Uh, he said, it is common uh, to many who walk along uh, broad, the broad of sin. Yeah, so, yeah, like he's, he points out, that many people will be going down the wrong path. Just because most people do it wrong doesn't mean that it's right. The divine law is higher than the human law. Uh, because many sin doesn't mean you should sin. In Article 2, he looks at unlawful sales. Uh, so a seller should be, is, if who's aware of faults, uh, should, should not uh, <laughs> um, uh, make fraudulent sales, and he's guilty if he does these, uh, these uh, 
these fraudulent sales and it's unlawful. So uh, he said he gives three examples of how this can be done, a threefold approach. Uh, in respect to things substance, so let's say you're selling something as uh, silver, but you've mixed in it lead or some other cheaper metal, um, then you've lied, right? It's fraud. You, you're not you're selling something as pure silver and it's not pure silver. Uh, you're selling something as wine and you've watered it down a bit. Uh, you're selling something as milk and you've watered it down a bit. Right? If, if you've committed fraud by hiding what it truly is, uh, by cheapening it, uh, that is fraud and therefore unlawful. Then you can have it fault, faulty measuring. So uh, back in the days when people would have a scale with them, you know, how much would you have? You'd have, you know, if you're selling rice or beans or whatever you're selling, uh, you put it on one side of the scale, on the other side of the scale, you had these standardized weights, which would then tell you how much it weighed. Well, if your weights were deliberately off so that every time you sold, you were cheating somebody of something, uh, well, that would be, again, fraud uh, using the wrong weights. Uh, and the la last is defective in the part of quality. Uh, this is off an awful lot like the first one, but let's say you knew an animal was sterile and you were selling it as a fertile uh, animal or the animal had some health conditions uh, and you were selling it as healthy, um, then that's again fraud because you advertise it as one thing and it's something else. Um, and St. Thomas says, not only is it guilty, not only is it unlawful, but restitution is, is owed. So if, if something has been done incorrectly and it's not worth what you sold it for, then they should be uh, compensated for their loss. Um, now, St. Thomas, he also points out this idea that the reverse is also true. If somebody sells you, they think they're selling you copper and you buy it and you find out it's actually gold, you should go back and perform restitution and pay them for the price of gold, not copper. Um, now that's a, that's a different one under American law, right? Um, if you get a good deal, right, the example in American law, an old example would be if you sold, uh, you bought a female horse and you just thought you were buying a female horse, and it turns out that the horse was pregnant, so you're really getting a two for one. Uh, you're getting a baby horse too. If nobody knew it, then lucky you. You made out. You got two horses for the price of one. Uh, if nobody knew, um, you know, so there's always going to be some case in which you go, well, you know, you don't quite. You not you can't always know. You know, you take a risk. You think you go to the antique store and you think you're buying something and you pay hundred dollars for it because you really like it and it turns out it's worth you know the van gogh you know and it's worth tens of thousands of dollars hundreds of thousands of dollars well and under american law you got lucky <laughs> um and if it wasn't you know if somebody advertises something as van gogh and it turns out that it's not and it was fraudulent then you can go after it but if it turns out they were just advertising it as a picture and it turns out to be a van gogh well you got it's your lucky day under saint thomas's approach really there's no lucky day you should just you should be honest right if you you accidentally sold the van gogh um you know if the person finds out that it's van gogh they should compensate you more for what they actually bought saint thomas's approach uh, in terms of correct advertising, he says you should really state the flaws. Uh, you know, if you know what something, uh, if, if something is damaged, something is broken, you know, in some way, um, you, you have to tell people what you know. Um, uh, and uh, he says it, it is somewhat balanced, though. So, for example, he says, treat, you know, under the Gospel of Matthew, you know, treat others as you want to be treated, right? Sell to people as you want to be sold to. Um, you wouldn't want to be defrauded, therefore you shouldn't defraud somebody else. So, uh, but he says, this is where it, it breaks from that a little bit. Uh, you're not required to offer help or counsel to the person. You know, if a person comes to buy and it has a defect, you have to tell the person that it has a defect. But you don't have to go around giving them all types of advice you know, there's a reason why you're selling it, <laughs> right? Um, uh, you know, you, let's say the person's buying a, a saw that they sell at Home Depot and 
you know, it has some problems, so you're going to get yourself a new one. Well, if a person comes to buy it, you have to tell the person who come to buy it the defects that you know about that saw. But you don't have to say, yeah, if it were me, I would just get a new one. That's why I'm selling this one. Well, that's that's extra advice that wouldn't necessarily um, be uh, good. It's not necessary. It's not necessary. You're, you're required to tell them what's wrong with you. You're not required to start going around getting advice on what they should do because uh, that's not your responsibility. Um, St. Thomas also said you don't really need to put the headline uh, in the you don't have to put the, the fault as the headline in the in the advertisement, right? You don't have to go around, you know, if you're selling it by word of mouth, you don't have to put up a poster that says broken table saw, you know. <laughs> um, well, you're not going to get many calls if the first thing on the advertisement is broken. <laughs> um, because people might assume, well, if you say it's broken in the first line, who knows what's really wrong with it? There's probably a lot of things they're not even telling me. Um, so you don't want to shoot yourself in the foot by being overly honest. Um, you know, you you do have to tell the person of the defect that you know before the sale has commenced, uh, before you've, you've had the sale, before there's been an exchange of money, you have to let them know. But it doesn't have to be in the headline of the advertisement in order for that to be honest. Uh, and at the same time, you don't want to waste people's time. You know, this might be to a further degree, but, you know, you, you don't want to tell people, oh, yeah, it's in great condition. And then when they show up, you know, maybe they drove an hour to go to your house. Then you go, you know, as they're handing over the money, oh, by the way, here's the, the defects. Well, you've just wasted some time and effort. You know, you should be upfront before the person has uh, assumed the loss of some kind if they decide not to buy it. Um, you, St. Thomas says you don't have to disclose things which are obvious. So if somebody, if you're selling a horse and the horse only has one eye, you don't have to tell people that when they show up to look at it that they only that it only has one eye. It should be obvious that it only has one eye. Uh, but if the horse also has cancer and you can't see that it has cancer, well then that's uh, a secret. It's it's hidden you have to you have to uh, be honest about anything you know which is not uh, manifest um, you don't have to be obvious you don't have to be truthful about manifested things because they should know that right if it's a used car and it has some problems sometimes well you can hear the motor just as well as i can hear the motor you can hear the rattling muffler just as well as I can hear the rattling muffler. Um, you don't have to just go with what is obvious. And then also, lastly, and this ties into all of the above, and the price should reflect the defect. So, um, you know, if you're selling something that looks like new and you're selling it for a new price, but it turns out it has some major defects, well, then that's very tricky, right? Uh, if something has a problem, the price should reflect it, and uh, you should disclose it, and that's it. That's what would be fair. Um, you know, of course, you want to get as much as you can, but you know, you can't sell something for the price of a new one when it has defects and it's used. So you should just reflect the price honestly. Um, St. Thomas in Article Four brings up a very interesting point: of Can you sell something for more than was than what was paid for it? Um, now, this is, again, kind of goes against the heart of American capitalism, uh, this idea of even asking that question, because obviously the answer is yes, uh, from an American capitalist perspective. Under St. Thomas, it's a qualitative yes, a yes with an asterisk. Um, uh, selling something for more than you paid for it is specifically what tradesmen do. Uh, you are a tradesman, uh, you, you buy things at one price and you sell it for another price. That's how you make a profit. That's how you make a livelihood. If you didn't make a profit on selling things, uh, you wouldn't be in business and you would starve to death. You would have to go into another field. So because of this, uh, it's, it's a necessary evil in some regards because it is uh, natural, you know, trade is natural and it's necessary. 
Um, unless people are going to be completely self-sufficient, they need to buy things from other people. And people aren't going to sell things unless they can make some money off of it. Otherwise, like I said, you wouldn't survive. You buy beans for $100 and you sell beans for $100. What's left over for you to feed your own family at the end of the day? Um, he says services are straightforward, you know, housekeeper, civil servants. In some ways, these are straightforward because, you know, what's an honest day's wage? And then you pay that, right? It's, it's very straightforward. Now, tradesmen is a little bit more difficult because, um, uh, you know, by nature of it, you're selling items and you're trying to sell them for the most profit, you know, in the world. Uh, so how do you do this? And uh, he says in certain ways, it's, Tradesmen by nature have a certain amount of debasement. They're debased uh, by their very nature. It does not imply a uh, virtuous or a necessary end. Unlike a housekeeper who is doing a job of being orderly and neat and helping the functioning of a house, all of it is good. Um, you know, there's no bad way of being a housekeeper if you do it well. Uh, now you could be a tradesman and you might not do it it might be not be virtuous even if you do it uh, profitably. Um, uh, and he says this would be at the, very contrary to John Galt, um, Ayn Rand. Uh, One may not see gains as an end, but only uh, payment for labor. So if somebody has a very successful business, uh, the main goal of that business should not be profit. The main goal of a business shouldn't be money. Um, you should get paid for your labor. You should be paid for the value you've given to society. You should be paid for it. Um, but the, the goal should be the service of the community rather than the gain of money. Um, now that is definitely contrary to modern forms of capitalism today. He says, you can sell things for more than you paid, obviously, because of tradesmen are necessary, uh, even if he considers them a kind of necessary evil. Um, but they can only charge more, and to the degree that they are charging more, he doesn't say, but I think that's true. The degree to which you can charge more is dependent on a few things. One is, uh, have you bettered it in some way? So um, if you bought banana seeds and now you're selling whole bananas, you've planted the seeds, you've grown the crop, you've harvested, you've, you've bettered it. You know, how many people would want to pay money for those banana seeds? Not too many, not too, not, and not for too much. How many people would want to buy the fully ripened banana? More. And more, how much would they pay? More. Because you've bettered the product uh, by doing it. Or you bought lumber and you turned it into a table. You turn lumber into a table. That's bettering the lumber. Now people would pay more for the table than they would for the lumber. Suppose, hopefully, if you did a good job. So the, you can always charge for bettering, uh, and it depends on what you what you've made. I suppose you know, if you made a very big, nice house, it's going to be worth more than if you made um, a little cheap house, or depending on the skill. How much did you better it? Um, also, if there's been a, a change of time and place, um, you know, if you brought silk from uh, Turkey and you brought it to France, well, it might be worth more in France because it's in France, not in Turkey. <laughs> so you, uh, you have bettered it by changing its place. Uh, also, uh, time as well would, would clearly uh, matter. You know, it, with limited resources, something today might be worth more or less in the future. And if it's more in the future, um, you've added value um, to it. Not everything increases in value with time. Just ask people who invested in Beanie Babies. Sometimes things go down in price um, with time. If they go up, then you're allowed to charge something because you've held on to it for all this time. Uh, on account of uh, danger uh, incurred in transport. Now, maybe this is more of a medieval issue, but, you know, if you were bringing silk all the way from Turkey, you know, that you have risked bandits along the road and you've risked, you know, violence and you've had to stay at inns where uh, 
Uh, the owners may not have been upright and you could have been robbed in the middle of the night or murdered. You know, so the risks that you've taken should be compensated. Uh, and if you've had to pay anyone for any of this, you know, that you should be able to be compensated for uh, this as well. Um, you, so if you've bettered it, you've increased it, you, you've given value to it, uh, you, can, you can take advantage of that. But it's more like being paid for your labor rather than it is charge whatever you can, whatever the market can bear, right? That would be our today is it would be charge whatever the market can bear. St. Thomas would say no, you know, it depends on the time, depends on the place, and you should charge what is a reasonable price. Difficult to determine what is reasonable, but as I kind of pointed out, you know, you can't really nail it down mathematically to the penny. You know, you can just kind of be around the ballpark of what's reasonable. Um, and he says also that a cleric should not be a tradesman because it's aimed at worldly gain uh, and something that's something that cleric despises is worldly gain, um, kind of debases cleric away from thoughts of heaven to thoughts of earthly things. And he also says, quoting from the book of Sirach, uh, a merchant is hardly free from sins of the lips. Uh, it's very difficult, or nearly impossible to be a really uh, honest, um, honest tradesman. And, and this will get into usury next, right? When, when we're dealing with money, it's difficult to be involved with money without it ruining you to some degree. Uh, and in conclusion, just to sum it all up again, the four articles, uh, you may not sell things for more than they're worth. Uh, if you sell things, uh, they must not be deficient, or if they are deficient, you have to be honest about the deficiency and you should not uh, do it fraudulent, fraudulent, fraudulently uh, by uh, the changing the quantity or the quality or cheapening it in some way without telling the consumer. Um, you should treat the buyer as you would want to be treated if you were the buyer uh, and fully disclose what you know and have a price to reflect the condition of the product that you're selling. Um, and you can sell a price, uh, an item for a higher price uh, if you've improved it in some way, if you've bettered it in some way, uh, whether it's materially or accidentally, moving it from one location to another or by turning wood into a table, uh, in some way that you've changed it, you can require, you can ask for uh, additional money for it. That is what all we have here on cheating. Um, and the next topic is usury.